So I'm Robin Axel Adams. I'm the manager of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. We're so glad that you're here. Um, please make sure that you have signed in at the front so that you can uh, receive your CE or CME credit. Um, and you will receive an email in May for uh, the evaluations. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast today. We want to give a hello to our uh, broadcast sites from IU Health Hospital. We have Arnett and Ball, Blackford, Bloomington, Jay, North, and West. Um, from the School of Dentistry, we have the IUPUI uh, campus, and for the first time, the Evansville campus is listening in. So hello and welcome, Evansville um, School of Dentistry, and also Reed Hospital. And we just remind you to please silence all of your devices, um, and if you need to return a call, to please do so out there. And our speaker has no relevant financial conflicts of interest. Also to let you know, the last slide is, um, is Melissa's information, our speaker's information, and not the way to text if you have a question. So all of, your, um, all of your broadcast site coordinators do have my cell phone number, but if not, um, or if you would like it, I, let me just give it to you quickly now, and then we'll do it at the end. But this is a way for you to text questions and that I can give to Melissa at the end. So my number is 317-502-7621. So that's way you can, I know I was fast, but that way you can get texts. Um, and I will repeat that at the end a little slower. But I want to get into Melissa. Melissa Keyes is the Executive Director for the Indiana Disability Rights, the state's protection and advocacy agency, which provides advocacy ser services to individuals with disabilities. Melissa received her law degree from the IU uh, Robert H. McKinney School of Law. She was the Editor-in-Chief for the Indiana Health Law Review, Volume 8, and was selected as a 2010 Program on Law and State Government Fellow. During law school, Melissa served as a research and policy consultant to the Autism Society of Indiana. And before becoming an attorney, attorney, Melissa worked at Riley Hospital right here for children in the autism clinic, at which time she earned her master's degree in clinical psychology. Melissa has a particular interest in advocating for options to support decision making in adulthood. She represented Jamie Beck to become the first person in Indiana to have a guardianship terminated in favor of supported decision making and regularly speaks on the subject both locally and nationally. I had the great privilege of going and hearing uh, Melissa talk about this new uh, program and the new law, and so it was, I was so excited to be able to bring her here to help us understand um, this new way that we can help our patients um, advocate and help themselves more. So, Melissa, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I guess we just crossed that line into the afternoon, right? Um, so uh, as Robin said, my name is Melissa Keyes and I am the um, new executive director for Indiana Disability Rights. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology with a focus on serious mental illness and um, developmental disabilities and a law degree with a focus on legalese and table banging. So between the two of them, I've got pretty much everything covered. Uh, just kidding, I have crushing student loan debt and that's about it. Um, so today, uh, I'm gonna go this way, there we go. No? Uh-oh. This is the part where you watch me fumble with technology. It was working just a second ago. Of course, it works when you're practicing. Yes. There we go. I got it through the mouse, so. Okay, I will use the mouse. Okay. Okay, so today we are going to cover options available to help patients with decision making. So we'll talk about uh, the concept of shared decision making versus supported decision making um, in the medical context. And then we'll, we'll talk about some practical scenarios um, and what you guys might do to help preserve a patient's right to self-determination, because that's really kind of the focus of what we're talking about today. So start us off. This is Diana. Uh, Diana has schizophrenia. She lives alone. She's retired, so doesn't work. Um, her adult son, Greg, um, helps her around the house, helps her if anything major comes up. It's kind of a you know, support system um, for her. So Dana, uh, Diana slipped on some wet tile a few weeks ago. She's having terrible knee pain. So um, Greg goes with her to the orthopedic doctor's office to get it looked at. Doctor says, you know, oh, Diana, you've got a, t a ligament uh, tear in your knee. Treatment, we can either do uh, steroid shots and some physical therapy, or we can fix it with surgery. Neither option sounds desirable to Diana. It's causing her a great deal of anxiety um, because of her diagnosis, her age, her behavior in the office, the presence of her son. Um, the doctor begins to question her ability to consent to a course of treatment. 
right? Has anybody been in a similar situation? I know you remote folks are probably waving your hands and I can't see you, but um, Diana's scenario is not uncommon, unfortunately. Many adult guardianships start as a means to obtain treatment or admission to or discharge from a facility. And while guardianship is absolutely a necessary tool for those who need that level of intervention, there are much less restrictive ways uh, to help pre preserve a person's self-determination and independence. Um, and there's a lot of factors that kind of contribute to this problem. One is a misunderstanding of what capacity is. Um, it's not just a yes or no determination, as we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and the, the factors, the different factors that go into determining whether someone has capacity or not. Um, this can also be influenced by implicit or expressed bias about the abilities of people with disabilities, right, especially based on um, char known characteristics of a certain diagnosis. Um, another factor is not knowing how to accommodate that doctor-patient relationship um, to help the person making informed consents or, or help them through that decision-making process. So often when people with disabilities bring caregivers with them, either, either for functional or um, decision-making support, healthcare providers or, or other service providers may default to speaking to the caregiver um, instead of the person. And a healthcare provider should never, you know, question the capacity of the person with a disability to make a healthcare decision solely based on the presence of a caregiver in the room with them, right? Or solely based on a diagnosis. It should be individualized um, based on the person's, you know, actual level of, of functioning. So supported decision making, which we'll talk about here uh, in a second, in fact, exists to enable a person with a disability to retain that full decision making authority in the context of healthcare. The supporter may be present to allow the person with a disability to um, responsibly exercise his or her full decision making uh, capabilities. So finally, there might be a misunderstanding of uh, what decision making supports are being used, how they work, uh, and how they might be um, allowed in the, in, in the process. So with very limited exceptions, there are no services or supports or benefits in the state of Indiana that require someone to be under guardianship in order to access. I know sometimes parents might say, oh, I've got to get guardianship or else they can't get on waiver services, or I've got to get guardianship or else we can't get in that housing program. That's not true. There is no program in the state of Indiana that requires someone to be under guardianship uh, legally in order to access services. So um, there are options other than guardianship. Now, again, don't get me wrong, guardianship is definitely a necessary tool, but for those who are just getting guardianship uh, to be able to participate in a loved one's life or to facilitate access to treatment or access to services, there are other less intrusive ways that we can structure that, that it preserves a person's self-determination and independence to the greatest extent possible. Our goal here again is to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate in making decisions about their life to the greatest extent possible and in the least restrictive manner possible. And, and for many of you familiar with the concept of individualized support planning, person-centered planning, that type of thing, the concepts are, are very similar. So I want to talk briefly about this issue of capacity because that becomes the fulcrum point, the, the touch point, if you will, of how we decide whether or not somebody uh, is able to make an informed uh, decision. So capacity from a legal sense is, a, is an issue of fact based on different circumstances and factors, right? So, um, and it's important to note that capacity exists on a spectrum. There's not a single line that you cross where, you know, on this side you have capacity and then magically something happens and on the other side you don't. Um, whether someone has quote unquote capacity depends on things like the situation, uh, the complexity of the issue, as well as internal and external factors, right? It could be time of day, their physiological state. For anyone who's ever gone grocery shopping hungry, you make much different decisions than you do when you go on a full stomach somebody who has eaten cake for dinner before, and I'm guessing some of you have as well, that's, that's what we're talking about, that you make different decisions based on your own physiological state as well. Um, it can, you know, timing of day is also important. My morning people here, any morning people? Yeah, uh, I will never understand morning people. Um, I, my, my prime work time is like 10 p.m., um, as my staff will tell you, as they get emails all throughout the night from me. Um, so different uh, internal and external factors can influence a person's capacity and in, influence their decision-making ability. Their alertness may change based on when and what type of medication they have. Their medication may make them more alert and more uh, 
able to uh, interpret and receive information, or it may make them drowsy and less able to focus, right? Um, how much sleep they had the night before, whether they are experiencing active symptoms of their diagnosis. All of those factors contribute to whether or not someone has the quote unquote capacity to make a certain decision or not. Um, capacity can also change over time based on skill acquisition, right? So the more that you learn or practice a particular skill, the better you get at it. And the same is true with decision making. So for example, I have a driver's license, right? So that means the state of Indiana has said, I have the basic capacity to drive a car. Now, in order to demonstrate that capacity, I didn't need to um, rebuild a transmission. I didn't need to drive like Danica Patrick. I just needed to prove that I met that basic minimum requirements to keep myself safe, follow the basic safety rules, and, uh, and show that I you know, could drive without hurting myself or others, right? Now, um, my driving skills, although some might argue not, uh, have for the most part gotten better since I was 16. And I'm sure for many of you that the same is true, right? So um, there's also been advances in technology that make it easier and safer to drive. And, you know, cars beep at you and automatically back up and parallel park and brake for you um, and all kinds of, of different safety features that uh, have helped increase the ability for people to drive, right? Um, but even with technology and even with skill acquisition over time, my ability to drive fluctuates, right? So driving late at night, bad weather, my kids are screaming in the back for a snack. I'm much different than Sunday afternoon, Beyonce's on the radio, I'm driving to Target, living my best life, right? Mm -hmm. But the state of Indiana hasn't put restrictions on my license to say you can only drive when Beyonce's on the radio and you're going to Target. I would love that. That would make my life a whole lot less complicated. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. It's presumed that I'm going to use the tools and the resources and uh, all of the things that I need to be able to keep being safe, depending on the circumstances, right? The same, unfortunately, isn't always true for decision making. Oftentimes, people with disabilities have to prove that they can make uh, decisions covering a wide variety of areas, uh, a wide variety of complexity at all times and under a lot of different circumstances in order to maintain their ability to make decisions independently. Or it's presumed that since they can't make certain complex decisions that they can't make any decisions at all, right? Um, and so the point is, when we talk about this issue of capacity, we really need to think of it as a spectrum, not a yes or no. So just because someone may not be able to handle a really complex question right now doesn't mean that they don't have all of this other spectrum of abilities that they can handle uh, throughout that. So let's keep in mind all of the different factors that can go into that determination um, when we're thinking of somebody's ability to make a decision, right? So let's talk briefly about some different options for how we can help support people, keeping in mind a lot of these options, um, they can be used in combination, they can change over time to really individualize the supports based on the person's uh, strengths and needs. I'm a very visual learner, so this makes sense to me. If you're not, I'm sorry, but I'm the one who has to explain it. So um, so this is what I call the spectrum of assistance. And just to orient you, the top are the least restrictive things. And as you move down, it becomes more restrictive as far as the rights and the oversight that goes along with it. So. Um, to, the green things are things that can be done really informally. You don't need anybody's permission. They're very, you know, they can be very creative. The yellow things are things um, that really should be done in consultation with a professional, either a financial advisor, an attorney, somebody who's knowledgeable about how those certain documents work because they tend to have a legal or financial consequence to them. And then the third things that we'll talk about are things that you must go to court in order to access. So we'll talk a little bit about these different ways that are uh, out there to help support people um, with as much self-determination as possible. So starting with that least restrictive, the independence, or some people call it interdependence, as well as informal support. So these are ways to help fill the gaps in someone's needs. So for example, someone who has a hard time remembering to pay bills, you can set up automatic bill pay um, using credit cards with low limits. Um, there's also special credit cards that will limit the amount that people can spend in a certain store. Um, there's all kinds of ways to help people with budgeting. Um, there's smart medication dispensers. There's pill pack deliveries that will help people be able to um, administer their medication independently. There's grocery delivery services. There's mail services. This is one that I, I, I was fascinated when I heard about. There's some, an, a company that will take all of your mail, throw out all the junk, scan the important stuff and email it to you so you don't ever have to deal with or, or worry about missing 
a bill. It sounds fantastic, I know, right? So a lot of these things, they take creativity. Um, they don't always have to be expensive. It can be as simple as using a paper-based uh, calendar. Um, there's all kinds of smart home apps, smartphone apps. There's ways that you can remote, uh, remotely lock and unlock doors for people who may forget. Um, there's smart refrigerators and smart stoves. There's all kinds of, of ways to help support people be as independent as possible. And here's kind of an example. So my friend Jamie that, uh, um, I mentioned earlier who got out from under her guardianship. She moved from Richmond to Muncie and she had to learn how to navigate public transportation. So instead of putting in her service plan, you know, uh, Jamie will mes memorize the bus schedule with 80% accuracy over a two week period. Um, we used Pokemon Go, which was something that Jamie really spoke to and it allowed her to navigate and get out and about her community. And that's how she was able to learn the different streets, the bus timing and all kinds of things. So it didn't have to be formal, it didn't have to be rigid, but it was a way that really spoke to Jamie's individualized interests to help her accomplish the ultimate goal of learning transportation, right? How to get around. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about supported decision-making because even though the concept itself isn't new, the formalization of it in Indiana is, is new because it just started uh, July 1st of this year. So under Indiana code now, supported decision-making refers to the process of supporting and accommodating an adult in the decision-making process to make, communicate and effectuate life decisions without impeding the self-determination of, of the adult. What attorney wrote that, huh? Yeah, this one. Um, so this, this, um, definition is based off of a lot of similar definitions used by the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making as well as some other states. But basically, what does this mean in plain language? And its most basic understanding, supported decision making is a way to accommodate the decision making process. And for many of you, when you think about how you make a decision, it makes sense conceptually already. So in supported decision making, People who need support choose, quote unquote, supporters. We appropriately named that, I guess. These are generally trusted friends. They could be family members, caregivers, to help them through the decision-making process um, in areas of their life that they've identified a need for and in a way that they want that help to be given. With supported decision-making, the person has all decision-making authority, and it's a really uh, seen as a way to help increase empowerment, preserve self-determination, promote independence in decision-making. The formalization of it generally just means writing down that person's plan into a document called a supported decision-making agreement, which we'll, we'll touch on briefly in a moment. Uh, these arrangements, they can be changed as needed. They don't require a court to be involved. Um, and here's an example of supported decision-making. So the other day, my husband let me know that he and some other dads from the neighborhood were gonna start a bike gang. Um, bicycles, not motorcycles, they're not that cool. Um, it's like the most suburban dad thing that you can do, right? So he asked me, should I wear a helmet? And all the other women in the room are like, yeah, you should, right? So for me, my immediate mom response was, yeah, risk of traumatic brain injury versus looking cool with your friends. It's a, no pun intended, no brainer. You gotta wear a helmet. Um, but, you know, we talked about the pros and cons. I gave him the, my best I told you so's. Um, but ultimately he made the unwise decision to not wear a helmet. Um, not the safest choice, not the choice I would have made, but it was his choice nonetheless. Um, but as adults, we get to make the, those decisions. The cops didn't come and say, you made a poor choice, so we're taking away your bicycle, or we're gonna force you to wear a helmet, and if you don't, we're gonna take away your ability to make decisions over anything else, right? He's allowed to make a stupid decision and live with it. And that's, that's self-determination, that's being an adult, um, that's dignity of risk, right? And this is an example of supported decision-making. He used me as a supporter. He came to me asking for my advice. We talked about it. And uh, that's the cool thing about supported decision-making. It's what a lot of us do already when we're making decisions. Um, now, riding a bike without a helmet is obviously not the same as whether to get a potentially life-saving medical treatment. But no matter what that decision is or how much support the person needs or the type of support they need, it's much better to support someone to make the decision themselves instead of making a decision for them, right? So who can use supported decision-making? The short answer is really anyone who needs help making decisions. As we just talked about, it's really kind of how a lot of us make decisions anyway. So the concept, um, it can really be used to maximize participation, even for someone currently under guardianship. They can still use those principles, right? And while the concept really started with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it can be used for any disability or condition. 
uh, people with mental health issues, those recovering from addictions, those um, experiencing conditions of aging. It's really uh, the, the sky's the limit here. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, supported decision making here in a second. But getting back to our spectrum of assistance, um, talking about the, the yellow category. So we talked about supported decision making agreements. Next, we'll talk briefly about agency agreements. These are ones that you guys are probably most familiar with. Um, there are things like powers of attorney, healthcare representatives, representative payees, things like that. Um, that's where the person has the capacity to appoint someone else to make a decision or act on their behalf, right? So um, they can be written to address any number of circumstances. They're really flexible. They're really um, well-regulated. And they're just, you know, a general good idea to have as part of advanced planning, right? And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between them uh, in a second. And then obviously guardianships and other court initiated options are also available. There's several types available. Limited guardianships um, grants the guardian the authority to make decisions in a specific area, generally over either what's called the person, which is like medical decisions and where they live, or over what's called the estate, which is finances and property. Um, full guardianship is where the guardian makes all decisions for the person, right? The one thing that to keep in mind about um, guardianship and the court involved ones is they are very difficult to terminate. There are only two ways to get out from under a guardianship. One is if the person under guardianship dies, if the guardian dies that does not terminate the guardianship. It just moves it to a successor guardian. So if the person under guardianship dies that terminates the guardianship or you have to show by clear and convincing evidence that the person no longer meets that statutory definition of incapacity under Indiana law. Um, that requires a great deal of time, resources, medical testimony, um, all kinds of things. And it can be a very uh, costly burden uh, for someone. So that's why we wanna make sure before we jump straight to full guardianship that is a lot harder to undo, we start with the least restrictive option first and gradually move up until we meet that person's needs, right? Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about comparing the different options so that you can kind of see how these different things play out. So um, going back to our previous example of Diana and her son, Greg, under supported decision making, if, Dan had her, if Diana had her son as a supporter, she would be able to use his, her, uh, his support in the way that she wants to to, to help her make a decision. Um, there's been some research to suggest that sometimes people either with, you know, autism spectrum disorders or, or schizo schizophrenia sometimes um, report feeling stuck in the moment, it, uh, unable to make a decision um, right then when presented. And so um, it could be the supporter recognizes this and helps advocate to be able to make a decision later or recognizes that they're getting stuck and, and removes them from the situation. Hey, we're just gonna go take a walk around the atrium, talk about things, we'll come back and let you know our decision, something like that. Um, there's other ways to support by, you know, uh, explaining things in a way that makes sense to me. So the doctor's using all kinds of big language uh, and words that I don't understand help me understand what that means, explain it to me in a way that makes sense for me. Um, if I use any type of, con of communication devices, make sure that I c it's translating appropriately, um, making sure that I have the time and space to make the decision in a way that I want to. Is anybody a, a pros and cons list maker? Where are my people? Yes, yes. There's all kinds of different ways that people make decisions and every single one of them is appropriate if that's how you like to work. There's everything from literally flipping a coin to mapping out um, you know, pros and cons and mind maps and all kinds of things. However the person feels most comfortable to feel that they are making an informed decision should be the way that they get supported, right? Um, so under supported decision making, Diana gets to make the ultimate decision, but she's using Greg as her supporter and he's giving her that support in whatever way she needs for her to be able to feel comfortable in making the decision herself. So when we talk about power of attorney, if Diana um, had previously executed a power of attorney document naming her son as POA for medical decisions, uh, the doctor could look to Greg to make that decision on his mom's behalf in accordance with the language of the POA. Now, if Diana did not like the way that Greg was serving as her attorney, in fact, she could void it, rip it up uh, and go on her merry way. It sometimes can get a little more legally complicated than that, but in essence, she still has control over whether or not he can um, but sometimes he would be able to make the decision on her behalf. Guardianship, on the other hand, 
um, if Greg had been appointed to guardian, the doctor can look exclusively to Greg to make a decision about what treatment to do. Hopefully they would incorporate Diana's wishes, but they wouldn't necessarily need to from a, a legal perspective. So if you think about it, supported decision-making is I make the decision myself using a supporter. Um, a power of attorney is I appoint Greg to make the decision for me. And guardianship is a court has appointed Greg to make the decision for me. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about shared decision-making because um, sharing decisions as opposed to clinicians making decisions on behalf of patients is really gaining increasing prominence in healthcare, right? So shared decision-making has been defined as an approach where cl clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to achieve informed preferences. I did not write that definition. You can blame somebody else for that. Um, but so you hear a lot of the same tone and principles of supported decision-making. Uh, so at its core, shared decision-making rests on accepting that individual self-determination is ultimately the desirable goal and that clinicians need to support patients to achieve this goal whenever feasible. So self-determination in the context of shared decision-making also recognizes that need to support autonomy um, by building good relationships, respecting both individual competence and interdependence on others. And these are the same principles that are associated with supported decision-making, right? So see, we aren't so different after all. So what we're talking about when we're talking about supported decision-making and shared decision-making is self-determination, right? So what is self-determination? Self-determination is absolutely central to the human experience. And there's been a growing body of research about the benefits of supporting self-determination, especially for people with disabilities. So for example, people uh, who report having more self-determination have been shown to um, have improved psychological health, better quality of life, more employment and community integration options, increased health, welfare, safety, all kinds of things better uh, when you get to make the decision yourself. And if you think about it logically, um, when you are able to have control over your life, you end up you know, having better, uh, more positive outcomes as well. When denied self-determination, however, people can experience things like low self-esteem, passivity, feelings of inadequacy and incompetency, uh, feelings of learned helplessness has also been shown. And there's uh, been a correlation with significant negative impact on physical and mental health, longevity, ability to function, and reports of subjective well-being. Because think about it, if you don't get control over your life or if you don't have any input on decisions that are being made, do you really care? After a while, do you care what happens? You know, it kind of, uh, that, that learned helplessness kind of kicks in, right? So under uh, the shared decision-making model, it already incorporates the principles of supported decision-making, right? So when describing how shared decision-making could be accomplished, um, Elwin noted the process of you know, introducing choice, describing the options, often by integrating use of a patient decision support, right? Sounds a lot like supported decision-making. And then helping the patient explore preferences and make decisions. Now, some healthcare providers uh, have expressed doubts, right? Saying, you know, patients may lack the capacity or ability that might lead them to make, you know, quote unquote, bad decisions. And I love when people say, but what about those bad decisions, right? So there's this presumption of capacity that happens magically on a person's 18th birthday, where the state says, you know, congratulations, you are now an adult, right? Um, now, I don't know about you, but there is nothing magical that happens when you fall asleep at 17 and wake up at 18, right? At least not in my case, um, where you are suddenly, you know, a functioning adult. I'm, you know, in my late 30s, and I still don't feel like I have it all together all the time. Um, and here's, you know, kind of an example. And recall that, you know, I'm at best an adequate driver. So in college, where we all know great decisions are made, I decided to test fate by seeing how long uh, I could go with my tank on E. Anybody been there? Yeah? Um, it didn't start out that way. I was like running late for class, didn't have time to stop. And then I was like in a hurry to go home, go out, but it was like two or three days. So for those of you who are like, oh, it's on E, I better go. You can, you can go a couple days, trust me. Um, so I went like two or three days with that needle, just like hitting that E. Um, and finally off campus on my way home, my car died. And, uh, you know, so what should have been a $20 fill up two days ago was now, you know, a $75 tow to a gas station, $20 fill up and an embarrassing phone call to my parents saying why they were going to get a bill for $75 because 
you know, broke college student. Now, um, after this incident, the state didn't take my driver's license away. They didn't say, you know, you can only drive when your gas tank is half full, right? I was able to learn from that mistake. And I was able to move on and adapt and, and keep driving crappily, apparently. Um, and that's the presumption of capacity. That's having dignity of risk, right? Unfortunately, people with disabilities often are not given that same dignity to make mistakes. Um, they may find themselves in a position where their ability to make mistakes uh, is questioned for you know, bad choices that many of us have also made, right? How many of you ever heard or, or said the phrase, well, he's an adult, he can do what he wants, right? It's usually a he, sorry guys, but it, it is. Um, and you'll notice that you never say it when someone's making a good choice. It's not, you know, oh, Bill sure is saving a lot of money these days. Well, he's an adult, he can do what he wants, right? No, you, we start to question someone's choices, not based necessarily on their ability to make those, those decisions, but rather when someone's making a decision that we don't necessarily agree with. It becomes very value-based, right? And here's an example. My dad has smoked a pipe his entire life. Thankfully, he just quit a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a gross habit. I don't agree with it. It's unhealthy. It's expensive. It's just generally icky. But my sister and I constantly told him to stop smoking. My mom, doctors, friends, coworkers, everybody said, you know, you really got to stop smoking. But no one ever said, you're making an unhealthy choice that a reasonable person wouldn't make, so I'm going to get guardianship over you because it's clear that you can't make decisions related to your health. That's silly, right? Um, but for people with disabilities, they're sometimes held to that higher standard. Uh, they don't get that dignity of risk that my dad enjoys. They don't have their choices respected automatically by doctors or service providers. Um, you will see guardianship sought because someone is diabetic and wants to eat a cookie. Um, you will see guardianships sought because um, so-and-so doesn't want to have, uh, doesn't want to get cancer treatment. And you start to think, well, would that decision be the same if the person didn't have an underlying disability, right? How much dignity of risk, how much personal autonomy do we respect in the general public, and why are we not extending that same, uh, that same principle to people with disabilities merely because of the presence of a diagnosis? So this presumption of capacity, this dignity of risk, it's, it's what allows us as adults to eat cake for dinner and to not take our antibiotics as prescribed. Does anybody do the full course? I'm probably preaching to the choir, but nobody does, right? Um, to not work out and eat healthy like we're supposed to, to not wear bike helmets. It's what allows us to rack up debt and date the wrong people and run out of gas and do all the things that make life life, right? And this burden of low expectations is that we assume that people with disabilities won't make good decisions or don't know how to make any decisions. And so we don't even give them an opportunity to do so. And then we're surprised when they make a quote unquote bad decision. And we have this knee jerk reaction like, well, that didn't work. I guess they can never make a decision again. And it's not how we treat the general population. And it's not how we should treat people with disabilities either. Um, I'm sure many of us would not want our decision making skills evaluated based on the decisions we made when we were 19, right? Um, I certainly wouldn't. And people with disabilities deserve that same presumption of capacity, that same dignity of risk that we all enjoy. And here's, you know, here's, it's not a secret, but guardianship is not an impenetrable shield. It's not a chastity belt. It's not a bank vault. Um, it will not slap the cookie out of the diabetic's hand. Um, bad things can and do happen. It's unfortunately a part of the world that we live in. There's no guarantee of safety under any arrangement, including guardianship, including powers of attorney, including supported decision making. But that's not a reason to limit the options that are available to people with disabilities so that they can live their best, most independent, self-determined lives. Instead, people with disabilities should be empowered to use their voice, to have their voice respected. And that means if you do hear about abuse, neglect, or exp exploitation happening, having their stories believed, holding the perpetrators accountable. It's much better to teach someone how to identify that toxic, abusive, or exploitive behavior than to rely on someone always being around to do it for them because eventually they either won't have a person in their corner or worse yet, they'll have the wrong person in their corner. So lastly, Indiana is a mandatory reporting state so that if anybody becomes um, concerned about a vulnerable adult being exploited, abused, neglected, they're required to report it to the state. So there are you know, um, legal protections in place for that as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the scenarios and I, I apologize to the people who are remote because you probably won't be able to participate as well. Um, but so 
let's think of, of scenarios. Let's, let's look at the first one. So person presents to an ER with issues related to not following type two diabetes treatment protocol. What's the standard course that, that people might do? This is not a quiz. I'm not gonna like report you to the AMA if, if it's wrong or something like that. But in general, what do, you, what do doctors kind of do? Or nurses or PAs? Anybody? I honestly don't know, I'm, I'm curious. Okay. Okay. Are you a social worker? Okay. <laughs> job security, job plug up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The comments were consult with the uh, diabetic co coordinator, Ed educator, and um, reach out to social work. Anybody else? Yes. So looking at the, the response was, do they have enough money to buy it, to buy the medication? So um, checking about ancillary related issues. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. Um, what about, okay, we've got a person recovering from a fractured hip, wants to discharge home for rehab instead of to a rehab hospital. Mm-hmm. And how do you, so the, the, the question or the response was, you want to make sure that the person understands what they need. Um, and you do that through counseling, right? Money issue as well, whether they have insurance that would cover the rehab hospital or a home health aid. Yeah. Yeah. I need to get home to Fluffy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about a person in need of bariatric surgery? Mm -hmm. Right, because post-op surgery is very complicated and you can get very sick and very hurt if you don't follow it, right? Yeah. So does the presence of a disability diagnosis change those ideas and things that you guys just went through? Should it? Are there accommodations that you may need to make in the process or the counseling that you go through to allow somebody to better participate? Or do you just go through the motions and say, well, I don't think that they can really understand what I've said. So I'm going to request that they get a consult from ethics and we may need to get a guardian appointed who can make that decision for them. Or do you talk about what other options might be available to assist? Yeah. Um, so if you suspect that someone is having a hard time understanding the options that are available, what do you think you might do? Call for reinforcements. Yeah. So a lot of times, um, if they don't have a decision-making support in place, if they don't have, if they're not under guardianship, they don't have a power of attorney, but you're concerned about um, whether or not they have uh, a hard time understanding the options that are available, you know, calling for, for reinforcements. Um, I believe you guys have an ethics consult team or, or counseling consults or social work consults as well. Um, there's also tremendous advocacy, community-based advocacy groups that can help come out and sit with the patient and help with issues. And Indiana Disability Rights uh, has um, advocates as well that will come out and help with discharge issues and making sure the person has what they need uh, and understands what they need. So the, the whole point is, is that we don't need to jump straight to guardianship. There are other less restrictive ways that we can try and help support someone so that they have as much choice and uh, autonomy in the process as possible. And then the other thing, as uh, if someone is using a supporter to assist them in the decision-making process. You wanna make sure that you're following the wishes of the person. You wanna to speak to them, not speak to the, the supporter unless otherwise directed. If the supporter is there partially to help translate or to help facilitate communication, obviously go by the person's wishes, but you wanna take direction from the person, not the supporter. 
ask if they need time to think about or discuss the decision if possible, allow them that flexibility, um, accommodate that process, right? So we're all used to wheelchairs being an accommodation for mobility. Um, supported decision-making is that same way, but accommodating that decision-making process, right? So instead of jumping straight to, well, you can't move or walk, we're gonna put you in a hospital bed. That's, that's the same analogy here for supported decision-making. We're not gonna jump straight to guardianship. That may be the necessary needed tool later on down the road, but we're gonna try less restrictive interventions first until we move up and find one that suits your needs and, and um, allows you to have as much self-determination as possible. So how do you guys fit into this conversation? First, you wanna talk early and often about options, uh, making sure patients know what their options are, both with regard to whatever treatment decisions you're talking about, but with regard to um, their options for getting support, both uh, inside the hospital with their own natural support systems or external advocacy groups like what I was talking about. Um, you wanna to help to facilitate the use of the person's decisional supports. So if they come in and say, you know, oh, this is my supporter. I want them here in the, the room with me. They're just taking notes because I have a hard time processing and remembering. So um, they're writing things down for me so that I don't forget it afterwards. Allowing that process to happen or facilitating whatever needs to take place, you know, signing release wise or whatever to allow that to happen. Um, supporting the person's decisions because nothing is more demoralizing than communicating a decision and having it ignored, right, or having it uh, end run around it. And then finally referring them to resources where they can learn more about options that are available. And here are some great resources, a plug for, for my organization, Indiana Disability Rights. We have a website specifically um, looking at supported decision making. Uh, the American Bar Association also has a good a good group. There is um, a, a website that NDRN1 with sdmmedicalcare.org that has a lot of great resources for supported decision making specifically in the medical context. I believe I included a link to that in the, um, the setup for, for this program. Uh, and then there's a National Resource Center for supported decision making. So I wanted to make sure to leave plenty of time for, uh, for questions and discussion. This is my direct contact information if people are interested in learning more. Um, this is not, I'm not checking it right now. So if anybody texts that number, I won't be able to answer you. Um, but with that, I will open it up for questions. So I guess I have a, just a, a broad question um, um, about this particular law. So, so law generally operates to tell us what we should not do. Uh, it's usually proscriptive. And this law seems to be telling people what they can do, but the thing that they can do is something that they could already do. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I always get a little bit concerned about sort of over legislating, mm -hmm. um, that that can be confusing, particularly at the bedside. Mm -hmm. Um, when some of these interactions are things that clinicians are super familiar with anyway, like the elderly patient who brings her daughter with her to every visit, right. you know, that kind of thing. And that those things are already not only, um, permitted or were permitted prior to this statute, but physicians, you know, have have grown to almost rely on that relationship anyway. Mm -hmm. So so uh, I guess what is what it's what's the sort of like thrust of the of this? What does it do that um, what gap does it fill? Right. So when we think about because you're you're absolutely right. In general, this the concept of supported decision making is what we all kind of naturally do anyway. And that is one of the things that we hear is that, you know, then what's the need for writing it down or what's the need for the legislation? And the answer to that is, uh, unfortunately, there is oftentimes a presumption that people with disabilities inherently are unable to make decisions based on a, a diagnosis or based on their behavior, especially not necessarily when they come in with family members, but more so when they come in with professional caregivers, direct support services, um, or if um, this is kind of meant to cover the gaps for those people who their ability to make decisions is being questioned. Um, this allows them a little bit of legal maneuvering to be able to show that they can make that 
that decision themselves using the supports that they've identified and that that's legally recognized in Indiana. So it's structured very similar to the power of attorney statutes um, as far as language and function and safe harbor provisions and things like that. Um, but it is a way to help um, solidify the person's right to be able to make decisions to the greatest extent possible instead of saying, you know, um, it, and here's kind of an example. So Jamie, who we were able to get out from underneath guardianship, without her services and supports, she definitely meets that definition of incapacitated under Indiana law. So if we took consideration of those services and supports away, the court would say, yep, absolutely, she needs a guardian. But what we were able to do is saying, yeah, but with these supports, with the supports that are outlined in her supported decision-making agreement and the other um, structures that she has in place, she no longer meets that definition. And so this is a way to kind of legally have that be recognized, as well as included in the, the um, there's another piece to it that I didn't get into because it's mostly for probate attorneys, but um, there were additional changes made to the um, requirements for petitions for guardianship that they put in a statement about whether or not less restrictive options could be used. And so this is a way to codify what a less restrictive option might be uh, to recognize it. Thank you. I thought that was really informative. I have a quick question about um, how this meshes or more more um, particularly a concern about does it conflict with if someone uh, goes through this process to identify a supported decision maker then becomes definitively incapacitated, let's say acutely ill on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. um, how does this play into the default surrogate decision making hierarchy? Is this superseded? Does it you pick who you think is better to, if there isn't a definitively identified person already? Right. So it tracks very much with the um, language of the power of attorney statute. And so just as with if somebody was using a valid POA, if um, if there was a determination that the person no longer had capacity or if there was there's a provision in the law um, that says, you know, a court can always adjudicate somebody incapacitated and unable to use this process further that they'll, you know, they'll need additional services and supports. But so um, it's not meant to trump, it's meant to kind of fit in and provide that statutory authority for people to be able to use this. Um, again, mostly in the guardianship context, but also to be able to say, hey, this is why I'm using these services and supports. It should allow you as a doctor to feel more comfortable that the decision I'm making is, is being supported and not being um, exploited or trumped or, you know, this is why this person's here with me or this is why I'm doing the support the way I'm doing it um, to be able to provide that structure to that decision. But as far as, you know, somebody's using supported decision-making, they're in a car accident, they're in a persistent vegetative state, the same normal rules would follow as it would for any other support mechanism. Is that not potentially a, a huge challenge for the medical team to have been identifying one, one or potentially one or more people to support decisions on an ongoing basis, have an intimate understanding of this patient's health care needs and values and preferences to then have a sudden event occur and now the de facto surrogate decision maker is a completely different person who has whose authority supersedes the previously identified well, uh, supported decision maker if you remember the supported the, the the people who are supporting do not make a decision they don't make a decision at all they are there to help support the person so they don't have any right to make a decision they may also through other legal mechanisms serve as, as an attorney in fact or as a trustee or healthcare representative or something but in the context of supported decision making they the person makes the ultimate decision themselves and so the supporter has no ability to make the decision on behalf of the person so any other surrogate decision making options would would still be in place if that makes sense. I understand what you said. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The medical team and all the patients or whatever have trouble. Mm -hmm. Are there any special dispositions when the medical team and the patients in this case have cultural issues and or linguistic issues? 
in the context of supported decision making. Um, I mean, I don't know from personal experience, but I would presume that that you know that that would be an issue as well. The the thing to remember about supported decision making is that it's completely in the person's control. And similar to a power of attorney, they can rip it up and not use it if they don't want to. This is merely a means to be able to demonstrate if they need to that they have that ability to make decisions even though they're using supports. So if you know again we're saying I recognize that if I don't have any services and supports, I don't I don't have the capacity to make a decision, but if you allow me to use this wheelchair, for lack of a better words, through this supported decision making process, I can make that decision. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's going to be cultural factors that go into that. Um, there's going to be all kinds of, of different factors that go into that. But the cool thing about supported decision making is that the plan uh, and the person supports retain exclusively with them. They can choose who they want, the areas that they want, um, how they want. It's all under their control. Um, is the supported decision making agreement intended to be something that's available and accessible to people to fill out on their own or is it intended to be more of like a more akin to a power of attorney that is that should be drafted and signed with an attorney yeah well so as lawyers we are not fans of like legal zoom and the downloadable forms and things like that but um so the, the some states have put into their statute a required form that supported decision making has to be filled out like this, this and this, and it has to have this magic language. Indiana did not do that because we wanted it to remain flexible to allow it to be incorporated into any other supports that the person might need. So we have a form that we have developed and used. I am always happy to share that form. Um, I, it, actually, you can download it from our website where people can kind of go through and fill it out. Um, but we really wanted to make it flexible. So for example, oftentimes what you might see is somebody has a valid power of attorney, um, but they will add supported decision making language to it where it will say, you know, um, you see this a little bit more in the financial context, but it will say something like, um, I have, I'm going to use my supports to make decisions about my finances up to $500 a month, whatever their risk or budget allows, right? Anything over that, my power of attorney triggers and the attorney in fact makes that decision. So even within that um, power of attorney context, you can incorporate principles of supported decision making to allow a little bit more um, independence and flexibility. And so that's why we didn't want to require a form or require it have certain special language because we wanted it to be very flexible. Great questions. Yes. It does. Yes, the form has to be notarized, but um, and the supporters do sign, um, do sign, but the, the supporters don't have to sign in the presence of a notary. Can you talk a little bit about the regulation of who is the support, who's the support system, um, what qualifications they have to have, or if one of medical providers doesn't feel that they might be acting in their best interest? Yeah, yeah. So um, th we left the requirements broad. Um, so under Indiana law. A supporter just needs to be over 18. Uh, they need to be, because the person is in charge of naming their supporter and choosing their support team, we didn't want to statutorily limit it to people, but we do recognize that, you know, hey, maybe Uncle Gary, who was previously indicted for check fraud, may not be the best financial support person, right? Um, so there is a way that you can get court intervention to exclude a supporter if needed. Um, there's also a way through checks and balances of the other supporters on the person's support team where they can say, you know, the doctor can say, you know, hey, I have concerns about Uncle Gary being a supporter. I don't feel like they're acting in the best interest. The person can choose to get rid of Gary. Uh, the person can choose to um, use another person. And then um, if there is evidence or, or thoughts that a supporter is acting Oh gosh, you guys are going to test my, my knowledge. Willful, wanton, negligent, gross misconduct. And if anybody knows what wanton misconduct is, please let me know because it sounds fantastic. But so if the um, supporter is acting overtly malicious, uh, there's a way that you can bring that before court and have them excluded as, as being a supporter. All right. Oh, yep. 
Absolutely, I have no problem with it. If you want a copy of the slides, come see me and I'll check your name off on the list. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll Thank see you, you in January.